know is Dr. Frederick Lawrence of Gilbert, Arizona. He's been a collector, exhibitor, and researcher of scouts and scouting on stamps oh. since 1960 and is both a US national and an FIP international accredited judge and holds a research doctorate in engineering. The siege of Mafeking, South Africa during the second Anglo-Boer War is well known for Lord Baden-Powell, the garrison commander who later founded the World Scouting Movement. When stamps ran out, a local blueprint issue a local blueprint issue was produced, some of which are among today's philatelic rarities. Dr. Lawrence will let us tell us what's known and what yet awaits discovery by knowledgeable eagle-eyed collectors in his stamp chat, which we're about to watch right now, rarities of the 1900 Mafeking Siege blueprint stamps. Thanks so much, Dr. Lawrence, looking forward to it. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone, depending on your time zone. Uh, five o'clock here and 93 degrees in Gilbert, Arizona. And I saw Heidi wearing a winter jacket, so I imagine it's a bit cooler where she is. Our stamp chat today is rarities of the 1900 Mafeking Siege blueprint stamps. We'll begin with a brief background setting the contextual framework for both the historical uh, and a philatelic framework of the Mafeking Siege. Then we'll jump into the rarities. First, for the cyclist stamps, the essays, and the imperfect proofs. Then for the baden powell head stamps, the double print, the reverse designs, and the partially imperforates, including the famous imperforate between pairs and the recently discovered partially imperforate signals. Then the complete sheets. And we'll wrap up with a summary of what's reported, what's still to be found, and what could be of value to you if you were to find one of the missing rarities of the Mafeking Siege. The Second Anglo-Boer War raged in South Africa from 1899 to 1902 between the British colonial forces and the Boers, descendants of Dutch settlers who had settled in the Transvaal region of South Africa. That's the region today which surrounds Johannesburg and Pretoria. At the start of the conflict, the Boers besieged the small town of Mafeking in the northwest corner of the then Cape of Good Hope colony. Because Mafeking lay on the strategic rail line connecting Cape Town at the south of the Cape Colony and Bulawayo in the territory then controlled by the British South Africa Corporation, which became Rhodesia and is today Zimbabwe. At Mafeking, there was a maintenance and repair facility that worked both on locomotives and rolling stock. And by cutting the line, the Boers denied access along that line between the southern portion of the Cape and the Northern Operating Theater in the war. The siege was invested in late October, 1899, and the relief forces arrived May 17th of 1900, so a period of about seven months. In anticipation of this siege at the beginning of the war, the War Department, that's the equivalent of the Department of Defense here in the US, assigned Colonel Robert Stevenson Smith Baden-Powell as the commander of military forces. He would later become world famous as Lord Baden-Powell, the founder of the World Scouting Movement. We see his picture in the upper left. At the start of the siege, the military took over the postal operation. All able-bodied men were impressed into the defense of the town and teenage boys were organized to deliver the mail on bicycles. The military authorities bought and then surcharged all the stamps in the post office to raise money to pay for the operation of both the teenage boys who delivered mail on bicycles and the Kaffir runners who smuggled mail in and out of Mafeking during the siege. When the surcharge stamps were exhausted, they produced local stamps using a ferroprussiate or blueprint process. There were three stamps 
in two designs. One design showed a cyclist that's in the center on the left, and the other design showed Baden-Powell that was produced in two sizes, a small and a large format. Because the local stamps were produced under wartime conditions, not everything went according to plan. Occasionally, there were mistakes, resulting today in some world-class rarities. This is the Cadet Bicycle Corps. The leader was Cadet Sergeant Major Warner Goodyear, who is shown on the far right of the photo with three stripes or chevrons on his sleeve. The photograph was taken by Edward Ross, a professional and commercial photographer who was in Mafeking at the time of the siege. Shortly after the siege, he published a booklet entitled Mafeking Siege Views with photographs he had taken during the siege. This is one of the photographs from his book. It's actually an internet image of a photograph from his book. This photograph is the basis of the design of the cyclist stamps. It was taken by Dr. W.A. Hayes, the chief medical officer in Mafeking and a part-time staffer in the postmaster's office, which was known by its acronym PMO. This is a scanned image of an original ferroprussiate or blueprint copy of the photograph, which is in the Royal Collection of the British Monarch, currently Queen Elizabeth II. It's taken from the book, The Queen's Stamps by Sir Nicholas Courtney. A bit more about him and his book later. The first design of the cyclist stamp was produced by Dr. Hayes. We see here the one imperforate essay sheet of the first design. Note that there were four rows and three columns of oblong rectangular stamps. You can see the handwritten annotation of Dr. Hayes in the margin. Looking at the bottom, he tells us proof of the new one penny. I am doing another as this is not clear enough. This design was rejected because it was not felt that the stamps were sufficiently clear. The second design was produced by J.V. Howat, the siege postmaster. One imperforate essay sheet of the second design was produced. Later, after the siege, Mr. A. Thomas, who was a member of the PMO, wrote in response to questions asked of him by collectors that four copies of this sheet were retained and the other eight were destroyed. This stamp design was considered acceptable, but the essay was too small. So the final design of the cyclist stamp used this essay, but in a larger size. There is only one of the four copies believed to have been saved that is reported today. It was owned by the famous Dr. K. Freund, who wrote extensively about the Mafeking siege in the 1940s in the S.A. Philatelist, which is the journal of the Philatelic Federation of South Africa. Although his principal article about this stamp appeared in the S.A. Proof Journal. His collection was sold in the Maria della Quellera collection, a pseudonym, an auction held by Harmers of London in 1970. And it is still owned by the collector who bought it in that auction. He occasionally exhibits this stamp competitively, so keep your eyes open. You might see it in a national level exhibition near you. There were two imperforate proof sheets produced of the second design. One is in the Royal Collection. There is no image of that sheet in Sir Nicholas's book, so I cannot show it to you today. 
The other sheet was broken up into two pairs and four blocks. All four of these pieces are today in private hands. The pair in the upper left also was sold in the Maria della Coelho collection auction of Harmers of London in 1970. The lower left block was sold in the Sir Maxwell Joseph collection auction of Sotheby's in London in 1982. Then again in the Salisbury collection auction by Christie's Robson Lowe in London in 1995 and was last seen in the Cape Town collection auction of Spink in London in 2005. The lower right pair is from the Walter Grobe Segrist collection and was last sold in Christy Robson Lowe's auction in London in 1993. Finally, the image of the block in the upper right is from an auction catalog, but I have no more information to share with you today. I'm anxious to find out where this block is today and when it was last sold. When I put this slide together, I endeavored to place the images so that the borders between the stamp area and the dark outer margin, that's from the wooden frame that held the glass negative plates that were used to produce the stamps, more about how that was done in just a moment. Together, such as here and here. The result is that it appears that some of the sheet is missing. I don't think it's really missing, but rather that the image of the upper right block was cropped for use in an auction catalog or a price list. I hope nobody cut away what appears to be the missing piece of the gutter for this block. In 1949, Alfred Lichtenstein plated the cycle of stamps. He looked at hundreds of examples and recognized 36 different individually recognizable stamps, which he then arrayed into three plates, which he arbitrarily numbered one, two, and three, based on the stamps that he examined at that time. He postulated that his arbitrarily numbered plate number three produced about 50% of the total production. Plate number two, 42%, and plate number one, 8%. As a result, collectors and researchers today believe that plate number three was used first until it wore out, then plate number two until it wore out, and then plate number one, production from which was interrupted by the relief on May 17. Plate number experienced deterioration, which you can see in the bottom row and in the bottom margin. Stamps were produced by placing sheets of chemically treated paper on the glass negative plates, exposing them to sunlight, and then developing them using a ferroprussiate process. Ferroprussiate process produces Prussian blue. So the stamps are blue on white instead of black on white. There was of course no color photography possible in 1900. Hence, this original imperforate proof sheet is from late in the life of plate number three, the first plate used. Why the imperforate so-called proof sheets were produced late in the life of plate three, we do not know. The stamps with Baden-Powell's picture were based on this photograph, the same as you saw on in the earlier slide that was taken by Edward Ross. The literature suggests that the photograph might have been taken by D. Taylor, another photographer, but close inspection of the photographs and the stamps show that it was indeed Edward Ross's photograph, this photograph that was used. 
This is a photograph of the art master for the Baden-Powell head stamp. The stamp was designed by Captain Greener, a member of Baden-Powell staff during the siege. It has a handwritten annotation on the back from Greener, then a colonel stating that it is a genuine photograph of the art master of the stamp that he designed. The art master was produced by first printing a picture of the Ross photograph of Baden-Powell cutting it to shape and affixing it to a piece of poster board. Then the frame lines, the scrolling at the top and the value tablet were inked in with India ink. To get an idea of the scale, on the right is the head of a drawing pen, roughly the size of a modern day thumbtack. A photograph was then taken of the art master. 12 prints were produced, cut to size, and affixed to another piece of poster board in three rows of four stamps in each row. Then a photograph was taken of that paste up multiple. The glass negative from that photograph was used to produce the sheets of stamps. Unfortunately, things didn't always work out according to plan. During the production of the Baden-Powell head stamps, one piece of chemically treated paper slipped against the glass plate, producing a double printing or double print effect. You can see that markedly in the value tablets of the stamp on the far left and the stamp the third from the left, not as visible in the other two stamps. The stamp on the far left is from the Maria della Qualora collection, sold in 1970, and it appeared again in Harmers of London auction in 1988. The stamp next to it, second from left, was in the Sir Maxwell Joseph sale of Sotheby's in London in 1982, and then appeared again in the Guido Creveri collection sold by Harmers in Lugano, Switzerland in 1994. The next stamp, third from the left, was from the Goodyear collection of the philatelic properties of Walter Grove Segrist, who lived in Switzerland. It was sold by Christie's Robson Lowe in London in 1993. The last stamp, now on the far right, was only recently recognized as a double print. And it appeared in the Argyle Etkin auction in London in 2001 for the first time. This stamp has the so-called ball flaw, ring flaw, or bullseye flaw, which is immediately to the right of the three of the date, May 3. So here is the ball flaw or the bullseye or ring flaw. The flaw resulted from a small piece of debris, like a cinder, that intruded on the emulsion on the negative glass plate. Sunlight then refracted around that tiny piece of debris, producing the white ring of the ball flaw, the ring flaw, or the bullseye flaw. This is sheet position 11 in the lower right-hand corner of the sheet. This, the fact that the doubling is very difficult to see in this stamp, as it is also in the second from the left, suggests to us that what happened was the sheet of paper rotated on the glass negative with the center of rotation in the lower right-hand corner. So stamps there do not show much of the doubling effect, while stamps in the upper left corner of the sheet have a demonstrably apparent doubling in both the scroll and the value tablet. Only these four examples of the double print have been recognized, meaning there are eight yet to be discovered. I suspect that at least some if not all 
of the remaining double print examples still exist, but they're difficult to see. Unless you're really looking for it, you'll pass right over it. So these are probably in collections or dealer stocks just waiting to be discovered. Then later in the production, the granddaddy of all errors appeared. One sheet of paper was placed on the wrong side of the glass negative plate, resulting in the images in the stamps being completely reversed, i.e. a mirror image. 10 stamps from the sheet of 12 are reported today, three mint and seven used. There is today one mint in the Royal Collection and one used. Previously, there were three used in the Royal Collection. More about that a little later. The stamp on the far left is one of the mint examples in the Royal Collection. The image is from the book, The Queen Stamps by Sir Nicholas Courtney. The second stamp is also in the Royal Collection. The image is from the January, February, 1990 issue of the London Philatelist, the Journal of the Royal Philatelic Society of London. Once a year at the beginning of the fall season, the keeper of the Royal Collection puts on a display at the Royal with material from the Royal Collection. In late 18, 1989, the then keeper of the Royal Collection, Sir John Marriott, showed the display Africa, a miscellany, including this stamp. The next stamp, third from the left, used to be in the Royal Collection. The keeper of the collection occasionally sells stamps, decommissions them from the collection in order to raise money for acquisitions of new material. Duplicates are sold and the proceeds are used to purchase material not yet in the collection. Previously, it was not possible to know if an item had been decommissioned from the Royal Collection. The Crown, Buckingham Palace, did not permit that information to be made public. This stamp was sold by Harmers of London in 1996. Shortly thereafter, the policy changed and the Crown now permits material deaccessioned from the Royal Collection to be publicly acknowledged. When the policy changed, Harmers was allowed to disclose that this stamp had in fact been consigned to them after having been decommissioned from the Royal Collection. For those of you who exhibit or look at exhibits, you know that the provenance of stamps is also often indicated by parenthesis X and the name of the collection. Imagine seeing this stamp and an exhibit with prominence X, the Royal Collection. Clearly a stamp that would have high rarity value when it comes to judging that exhibit. The last stamp on the far right was from the Maria della Quella sale in 1970. Two more of the reverse designs. The stamp on the left is from the Guido Creveri collection, again sold by Harmers in Lugano, Switzerland in 1994. And the stamp on the right was once in the Goodyear collection of Walter Grove Segrist, sold by Christie's and Robson Lowe in 1993, and then appeared in the Salisbury collection, sold by Christie's, Robson Lowe in 1995. Prior to that sale, there was an exhibition of rare stamps in the Claridge Hotel in London. This was one of the stamps that was on display in the Claridge House prior to its sale. It then appeared 
in the Harry Burkhead collection, which was sold by Spink of London in 2014. Harry Burkhead was an accomplished collector of Anglo-Boer war material and wrote a number of small books, really pamphlets, on the sieges that took place during the Second Anglo-Boer War. So again, today, 10 examples known, three mint, seven used, one mint, and one used in the Royal Collection. We know that this is true because in 1954, the keeper of the Royal Collection, then Sir John Wilson, published an inventory of the holdings of the Royal Collection. At that time, the collection possessed four reverse designs, one mint and three used. Today, the collection has one mint and one used. T two of the duplicate reverse designs have been deaccessioned and sold to private collectors. In 1947, a collector whose identity I have not been able to determine, offered to Stanley Gibbons these two Baden-Powell head imperforate between pairs. The lower pair is currently in the Royal Collection. The upper pair is in private hands. The upper pair was sold in 1947 for 50 pounds sterling. In that year, the official exchange rate of the pound to the US dollar was $4.03 per pound. The pound did not float against the US dollar until 1971. So 50 pounds was $201.50 in 1947 money. In today's money, ingested for inflation, $2,350. The 2021 Scott catalog value for the imperforate between pair is, as we'll see in a later slide, $100,000. That is 42.6 times the adjusted for inflation price of acquisition. Or if you look at it as an annual rate of return, 8.875% across the 73 years from 1947 to 2020, just a little better than the US stock market has done. The British monarch at the time was King George VI, the father of the current Queen Elizabeth II, who bought the lower pair that is now in the Royal Collection. The upper pair was seen in the Phillips of London auction in 1992, where it realized a little over 52,000 in then year dollars. It was exhibited in the Salisbury collection in the Claret Hotel, and then offered in the Salisbury collection sale in Christie's Robson Lowe in 1995, where it dropped to 47,000 and change. In 1999, it was bought by the current holder in a private treaty sale. Rumor is that the price was just north of 52,000. Here's the front of the Stanley Gibbons sales booklet in which the imperfect between pair was sold. Note the selling price, 50 pounds. And the notation that the stamp would be Stanley Gibbons number 20A in the next edition of their catalog. That is still the catalog number of the stamp today. Now, today we know Stanley Gibbons from its store on the Strand in London, but at that time they had an office in St. Albans, which is today a district north of downtown London. There was only the imperforate pair in that booklet. Here is the page on which the imperforate pair was offered in this small glassine envelope. So far as we are aware, 
only two of this rare imperforate between exist, and no more imperforate between pairs have shown up since that time. Extremely rare and interesting imperforate between. The buyer was C.A. Sands Esquire, who lived in Stroud. In late May, he wrote to Stanley Gibbons, and we see here the reply from a director of Stanley Gibbons to the buyer who was offered the stamp on approval. I have the pleasure to inform you that I have no hesitation whatsoever in guaranteeing this item as being genuine in every respect. And should you wish me to do so, I will be pleased to place our guarantee mark on same upon return of the stamps in question. Mr. Sands did not return the stamps and there is no expertization mark from Stanley Gibbons uh, on the back. The director continued, in regard to your second comment, you will, I feel sure, appreciate that it is impossible for us or any other business concerned to forecast the future or to make any definitive statement as to whether you would always be able to realize the value on these stamps should you wish to sell same at a later date. The stamp market is, of course, as we know still today, one of supply and demand, the same as any other market, and the buyer as a businessman will no doubt realize the impossibility of forecasting the values on the market. Again, catalog value today, $100,000 for an imperfect between pair. In the late 1990s, a fellow scouts and scouting on stamps collector, who is also a stamp dealer, visited me here uh, in Arizona. He brought with him a stock sheet on which there were several dozen blueprint stamps, including this very interesting stamp on piece to which my attention was immediately drawn. As you can see, it is torn imperforate on the left and the right and cut imperforate by scissors or by a knife at the bottom. My friend told me that he had purchased the stamp some years ago, about perhaps 10 years ago, thought it peculiar and set it aside for future study. Notice that the upper left-hand corner of the stamp is missing. That fits nicely with the small piece of stamp in the upper right-hand corner of the pair that is in private hand. This reconstruction was done electronically by a friend of mine who is much more computer savvy than I am. This is what the five imperforate between stamps looked like when the sheet was together. Whether we are looking at the first and second rows or the second and third rows of the sheet, and the first, second, and third columns, or second, third, and fourth columns of the sheet, we cannot tell. The Baden-Powell head stamps are not platable, except that some of position 11's exhibit the ball flaw, the ring flaw, or the bullseye flaw, if the sheet was produced after the piece of debris intruded on the glass emulsion. Looking at the partially imperforated stamp, the dark area on the right edge suggests to me that this might be the sheet margin, in which case we are looking at sheet columns two, three, and four. But we can't be sure until the remaining stamps are recognized and can be compared with this reconstruction. Now let's look at the complete sheets. Of the cyclist, there are three complete sheets. One is in the Royal Collection, but there is no illustration of it in Sir Nicholas's book. I have been unable to locate an image of it, or I would show it to you if I had it. This is one of two sheets in private hands from plate number two. 
It appeared in the Salisbury Collection, again sold by Christie's Robson Lowe in London in 1995. And there are two sheets from plate number three. One again in the Royal. This sheet was in the Guido Craveri collection, again sold by Harmers Lugano, Switzerland in 1994. And then it appeared again in the Hadley collection, sold by Ivy and Mater in New York in 1995. I'm not sure where this sheet is today. There are two but more likely three complete sheets of the small format Baden-Powell head. One collection, one sheet, this sheet is in the Royal Collection. And it is well known as the sheet in the Royal Collection because it is missing this small piece of salvage in the upper left corner. This image is from Sir Nicholas's book. The second sheet in private hands was in the Grobe Secrets collection, sold by Christie Robson Lowe in 1993, and then appeared again in the Salisbury collection in 1995. Notice that this sheet contains the ball flaw in position 11, whereas the sheet that in the Royal does not. So this sheet was manufactured before the intrusion of the piece of debris onto the emulsion of the glass plate. And this sheet was produced after that intrusion. Also notice that there is an owner's mark that has been applied in the margin in the lower right corner. I have yet to decipher those initials and can't tell you who the owner was. Auction catalogs, including the catalogs in which this sheet has recently been sold, say that there are only two complete sheets, one in the Royal and this one. However, I believe there is still a third complete sheet in existence, as there was one in the Cape of Good Hope collection of the late Gene Bowman. I last saw it when his collection was exhibited by his widow in Johannesburg in 1998. Since then, that collection has been locked in a bank vault. When she eventually sells the collection, we'll know for sure if that sheet is still there. There is one almost complete sheet of the large format Baden-Powell head. The same design on both the Baden-Powell heads. The difference in size is slight. The small format is 18 and one half millimeters from frame line to frame line. And the large format is 21 millimeters across the frame lines. This sheet was produced after the glass negative was dropped and broke. The break can be seen as this line that runs across the bottom two rows of stamps in five position. It starts here in the left margin, crosses the top of position number nine, just touches the corner of position 10, just exits the bottom corner of position six, and then can be more readily seen in position seven and eight. This is called the crack plate variety. The sheet is missing salvage in the bottom margin and is clearly canceled to order on May 12th, five days before the relief. At this time, at the turn of the 20th century, used stamps were considered more valuable by collectors than mint stamps. So I suspect this sheet was canceled to order in order to produce used stamps, which were then considered to be more valuable to collectors. 
Would that they had kept this sheet uncanceled so that we could see the cracked plate clearly, but it is what it is. There is no other complete sheet of the large format Baden-Powell head stamp. If you'd like to learn a little more about the Mafeking Blues, the primary resource is Robert Goldblatt's article, The Mafeking Blues, which appeared in the Essay Philatelist in March of 1978. That was 42 years ago. Looking at what is known today, there are some errors and omissions in his article, the result of research that has been conducted and discoveries made in the intervening years. The supplemental references that I show here discuss the changes that need to be made to the original Goldblatt article. I mentioned earlier Sir Nicholas Courtney's book, The Queen Stamps. This is a scan of the dust jacket. It was printed by Methuen in the UK. You can borrow this book from major philatelic libraries or purchase a copy from most booksellers. I should note that the foreword to this book was written in, prior to its publication in 2004 by His Royal Highness, the Duke of York. He is Prince Andrew, who recently resigned from all public roles as a result of his association with the Jeffrey Epstein sex trafficking scandal. Now let's wrap up with a summary of what's been reported and what's still to be found. Of the cyclist stamps, the first design essay imperforate sheet is in the Royal Collection. Of the second design essay, four examples are to have survived, only one of which is reported today. Of the imperforate proofs of the second design, one complete sheet is in the Royal and all 12 examples from the other sheet are currently reported and in private hands. If you wish an imperforate proof, you'll have to buy one. Current catalog value, $25,000 for a pair, blocks pro rata. Of the Baden-Powell head stamps, there are only four reported examples of 12 stamps that were affected by the shift. The current catalog value is $25,000, which to me seems quite low, especially since there are 10 reported examples of 12 that could exist of the reverse design whose catalog values are $100,000 mint, remember three mint, and 55,000 used, remember, seven used, one each in the Royal Collection, so one mint and seven used in private hands. The granddaddy of the rarities is the imperforate between. There are two pairs reported from some number of pairs or a triple or up to seven, possibly eight singles from the sheet, depending on the geometry of the five stamps that we now know exist. Catalog value for the imperfect between pair in private hands, again, $100,000. And the partially imperfect single recently listed by Scott is valued at 45,000. If anyone wishes to follow up with me with comments or questions, you can contact me at my email, i.e. consulting at cox.net. Thank you for participating in today's stamp chat. Now you know all about the rarities of the 1900 Matthew King Seed Blueprint Stamp. Keep your eagle eyes open for these rarities. In the auctions, in collections, and in dealer stocks. You just never know what the value could be to you if you were to spot one of these 
still unreported rarity. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. You can keep your screen up if you don't mind. It'll it'll be a nice background and people can look at your references, which are ample and mighty. And of course, you're gracious enough to share your contact information. We really appreciate it. Friends, uh, if you have questions for Dr. Lawrence, please go ahead and use the chat or the Q&A box, please. Dr. Lawrence, we have our first question. The question is, what are the white lines between the stamps in the imperforate pair? All righty. Let's go back up to the image of the imperforate pairs. Okay. Again, the way that these stamps were produced was the art master was produced on a piece of poster board, then photographed. 12 prints were made of that photograph and those 12 prints were pasted onto another piece of poster board in three rows of four stamps per row. The white that we see between the stamps is the poster board behind the pasted in images of the art master. So this was a photograph of the art master this also a photograph of the art master, 12 of them pasted onto a piece of poster board, again, three rows by four columns. The same process was used to make one pound notes of five denominations of notes prepared during the siege. There are at least three papers according to watermarks. Are there watermarks in any of the stamps? Yes. Uh, now, the, uh, the comment is correct. The one pound siege note was made by the blueprint process. Uh, and those notes were made by the photographer, Ed, Edward Ross. Uh, and there's a, a, an intriguing photograph in his book showing the notes being pinned onto a clothesline, like a close, like a, a close that you would pin to a line outside to dry. And uh, he and some of the other members of the postmaster's office or PMO staff are, are standing around and watching the one pound siege notes uh, dry uh, on the line. The other good fours that were uh, valued in pence were produced by the local printer, the same printer that produced the Mafeking mail seed slip. So the other good fours or, or paper currency were printed, whereas the one pound note was made with the Ferro Prussier process. Now the stamps themselves were made on paper about the size of the current European A4 paper, the paper had one watermark near the center, the words Oceana Fine. Oceana with a capital O and lowercase letters, C-E-A-N-A. -A. Underneath it, the word Fine in all capital letters. If we have enough time, I may be able to find an image of that on my hard drive to show you. Freund tells us that only 8% of the blueprint stamps have part of one of the letters of the Oceana Fine watermark. And that percentage is repeated by Goldblatt in his article in the essay Philatelist. Less than 8% of the stamps then have complete letters. There are a couple complete reconstructions of the watermark in which each stamp has almost a complete or complete letter. I've seen a couple of these show up in the auctions uh, over the years. In 1986 at Ameripex, I decided to put together my own reconstruction of the watermark and I bought a stamp with a complete letter. 
I am still missing two letters in my reconstruction. So that was 1986. That was 34 years ago. So I have found all but two letters in 34 years. They're really difficult to find even parts of letters uh, on the stamp, but you don't need a watermark detector. Just turn the stamp over and hold it up to the light. The watermark is so clear that it can be seen just with natural light. Thank you for that. You're always so thorough, Dr. Lawrence. Thank you. How were the chemicals need? How were the chemicals needed to produce the blueprint stamps obtained? Uh, as I mentioned, the stamps, the original stamps that were in the post office, were confiscated by the military and surcharged with higher rates to pay for the operation of the post during the siege, to pay for both the cadet bicycle corps and for the Kaffir or native runners who smuggled mail in and out across the siege lines. Be careful about the use of the word Kaffir, K-A-F-F-I-R. The literature refers to the Kaffir runners, but today Kaffir is considered a derogatory term referring to native South Africans. So just be careful about using that term in other than a philatelic context. The Kaffir runners smuggled mail out across the siege lines, both to the north and the south, and brought in messages for the military forces. They also brought in supplies of the chemicals that were used to produce the stamps. So the chemicals were not in Mafeking at the start of the siege. They were requested. Note was sent out with a runner requesting the chemicals. A runner who went to the went to the south, down to, down to Kimberley, and the supplies were assembled in Kimberley and then carried back by uh, a native runner who smuggled them at night across the Boer siege lines. That was a pretty dangerous business. If you were a Kaffir runner and you got caught by the Boers, that was it for you. Light out. <laughs> we have a, a friend who's asking, I have not seen the Oceana watermark in a note. In a note. Uh, not sure what, sure where, to what the, the participant refers. Um, it is discussed in the Goldblatt article the Math King Blues in the essay Philatelist. Uh, uh, and um, Dr. Freund was in the process of writing a multi series uh, article in the South African Philatelist before his death in the late 1940s. The article series was not complete. Uh, unfortunately, the, the section or sections dealing with the blueprint stamps. Uh, were not uh, complete. However, uh, Dr. Freund did write an article about the watermark that appeared in the essay Philatelist in the very early 1940s. I don't have that reference on this slide, but if the participant will email me, uh, I will supply the reference to the article that first discusses the Oceana fine watermark. And at the risk of having another major computer meltdown on my end, uh, I won't go looking for an image of that while we're connected here today. But again, email me and I'll send you a reference to it. And if I find my image of it, I'll attach that to the email as well. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. The, the, our, our participant clarified that it's the one pound notes. Yes, the one pound notes were made with the ferrocrussiate process. Now, the one pound notes were uh, all numbered and uh, there is an accounting or an inventory of those notes and almost all of them are accounted for by number. Although they could be surrendered, that is exchanged for cash after the siege 
only a very small fraction of them were ever exchanged at the Standard Bank, which supported the notes. Now, Standard Bank had branches all over the United Kingdom, and there was a Standard Bank branch in Mafeking, which supported uh, all of the siege currency, including the one pound notes. If you're interested in more information about the one pound notes, uh, the Mafeking expert is John Ineson in Viewers Suffolk, UK, and he has written about the siege currency. In fact, he has an entire book uh, about the meal tickets and the siege notes, including the one pound banknotes. And if you're interested in that, email me and I'll put you in contact with him directly. He also sells on eBay, so you can purchase his book either directly from him uh, or on eBay. Thank you. And as per usual, Dr. Lawrence, you're always so thorough. Friends, go ahead and take a, a screenshot of the resources if you wish, or uh, make sure that you write down Dr. Lawrence's email. Um, with that question, we're going to conclude tonight's stamp chat. And we thank everyone for your attendance tonight. And of course, Dr. Lawrence for joining us from Arizona. He will be our presenter throughout the winter. So please check uh, stamps.org backslash news or better yet subscribe to the Stamp Chat newsletter that you can find also in the same section. And you can keep up to date with these upcoming Stamp Chats. And again, Dr. Lawrence will be joining us. Today's Stamp Chat was sponsored by the APS Membership Department. Becoming a member of the APS is easy. Visit stamps.org and apply online. Remember all of the great benefits that you can get by, by becoming a new member. And if you join now in new member November, boy, there's all sorts of fun stuff that you will be entered into, including one of three lifetime memberships in the APS. This special is open to new members only who apply from November 1 through November 30. But again, um, for our 2020 challenge, anyone who recruits a member, boy, you get rewards too. So have a look at that. For more Stamp Chats, visit and subscribe to the APS YouTube channel where you can find nearly 70 presentations. Use the comment box to keep the conversation going. Have an idea for a Stamp Chat? Well, send me an email, Heidi at stamps.org. I'd love to hear your idea. And remember friends, keep collecting and keep connecting. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And of course, on stamps.org, APS social since 1886. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And thanks again so much, Dr. Lawrence. Great chat. Thanks everybody.